Has anybody started? No? No? I mean, you can all certainly could, even before today, you could have done the first problem, right? The hand problem. Uh, and the second problem it has wells, so you, you, know, you really need what we do today. <laughs> So what we're going to do now, uh, Dr. Balhoff sent everyone uh, his solution to homework four, right? Uh, so we're going to sort of go, by, go through it kind of line by line and just talk about some best practices or coding tips. And feel free to, you know, let's, let's make this really interactive. Feel free to ask me questions and if you don't understand the part of the code. If you have a laptop, hopefully you, you can pull it up in front of you or whatever. Uh, so today, we're going to go over Dr. Balhoff's code, um, and then on Tuesday, I'll probably, I have my own code that I wrote in Python, and uh, I want to show you guys that on Tuesday, just because, well, <coughs> believe it or not, uh, one of the most common exit interview complaints we get from students is, why do you teach us MATLAB? Because I'm going to go work for, I've got a job at mom and pop small company, and they don't have MATLAB. Why don't you teach us Excel? Well, first of all, you can't solve a 100,000 by 100,000 grid block system in Excel. If you can do it, you have my permission to, to try, OK? Uh, but the point is, I'm going to show you on Tuesday in Python, uh, which is a open source free language that can do everything MATLAB can do. Uh, and it's absolutely free. And you can run it on a Windows machine, a Mac, a Linux box. You can even run it on a USB drive. So, and also I'll show you that the structure, I may even pull the two codes up side by side to show you that the structure is very, very, very similar between the two. So um, it's not, the point is not to um, sort of say you should use Python or anything else. It's just to show you that the point is that you need to learn how to program. It doesn't matter. The language doesn't matter. And so don't, please don't say on your exit interview, don't, you know, you taught us MATLAB and I only have Excel or something like that. There's lots of options for you to program in. And in fact, the more languages you learn, the easier it is to program in, in multiple languages because they're, for one, all similar. They're shared characteristics. And, you know, two, it's, it's really, programming is just logic, right? It's just, for this many times, do something. If this is true, do something different. Right? I mean, it's just logic. So anyway, so we'll go over his code today, and then I'll show you my code next time. So it's probably best to start an input file. So. An input file, I mean, these, this is where your inputs are, but there, there is something that you may have never seen in this, in that he used these things, this syntax reservoir.fi. Have you ever seen that syntax? These are called structs or structures, OK? And so basically, reservoir is like a group of things that pertain to the reservoir. The length of the reservoir, uh, the thickness, which is that even used, but the height or the area, rather, um, the permeability. There's m multiple options as to how you, you, know, you, can, you can provide your own list, individual kind of hand-typed out list of permeabilities. You can use a homogeneous permeability. Uh, in this case, it would be 20,000 grid blocks with a homogeneous permeability. And you can also import uh, just by, so you can only have, for permeability and fee, you'd only want to have one of these uncommented at a time, right? So right now, we're, the first problem we'll solve will be this four block system where the permeability in the four blocks is 75, 100, 150, 125, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, and 0 0.22. Okay, so one advantage to using this structure is a couple advantages. One is a good program, a good programming technique is to break your code up into m many small functions. And the reason for that 
is it's easy to test the small functions, right? So if I, you know, I, li I live coded uh, that problem in class that day. So you have a known solution, because uh, the, exa the, the example that I posted online is the exact same answers of example seven in the examples uh, and that were sort of hand worked, and it's also the exact same solution that CMG provided. So we're going to believe that that answer is correct. It's the truth, right? And in that, if you go and look where I posted it, I mean, I compute all the interblock transmissibilities, right? So if you had a function, if you broke your code up into one function that took i and j, you know, where i and j are two blocks, and computed the interblock transmissibility of it, you could test that. It's a very small function. It's like three lines, right? Because you have to compute uh, the half permeability, the harmonic average of the permeability, and the, and the arithmetic average of the delta x's, and then you just plug that into an equation. It's three lines, right? That's your half transmissibility code, okay? In fact, I think he, I think he did that, right? So um, t half, right? Yeah, so it's like three lines of code, right? So this small, tiny little code is easy to test, right? So, and so the idea is that really what you want, you don't want your just one, you don't want just one long code, right? That, that's, you know, one file beginning to end, right? You, what you want to do is break it up where it's logical into small pieces that you can test individually, right? So in MATLAB, that means function files. And unfortunately, one disadvantage or one thing I don't like about MATLAB is those individual functions all have to be in their own file, right? Most other languages would allow you to group those, right? You could, you could have, you know, th things that work that sort of make sense together could create a module or something like that, right? So you could have you know, multiple of these. And then you don't have 10,000 files on your file system that you're hunting through, right? But the idea is you want to break the code up into smaller pieces of where it makes sense. And these small functions are easy to test. You can compute, you can get, give it just two, one i and j, and you can compute the outcome by hand. It's easy, right? And then you know if this code is right. So when you're not getting the correct answer, or when you're debugging your code, you can sort of eliminate it one, where the problems are one function at a time, right? If you run this code on just this t half, and you get the same answer that you hand computed, you can leave that behind and say, okay, I know this is correct. I'm not going to touch it anymore. There's an, the error is somewhere else in my code, right? So back to the structs. Now, um, this isn't so bad, but in this, in this guy, there's dx, which is an array, right? So you're passing in dx, which is an array. Uh, what else is there? The, well, they're off the screen there, but there's the permeabilities. The permeabilities, which is an array, so there's, there's four there's four items in dx, and there's four items in permeability, and then we're just grabbing the i and the jth one that we need. And, and then down here, there's uh, the other input is the reservoir.h, reservoir.w, and fluid viscosity. The point is, if you didn't have those structs, you'd have to pass in all of those things individually as in the argument list, right? So your argument list, instead of being Reservoir, fluid, numerical, it would be dx, perm, reservoir, a, you know, h, w. And in this case, it's not that bad, but you could imagine a function that might have use a lot of data. Your argument list is going to have 50 things in it, right? Because one thing you don't, you never want to do is have a global variable. If you have a global variable, you're doing it wrong. Stop. There's another way to do it. Never use global variables, okay? So the, so the point is, you need, you need, you need those that data inside this function, and the only way to get it in there is to pass it in through the argument list. And these structs just give you an easy way to do it, right? So you can group the things together. Now you just pass in the struct, and you can access the, the data from it. Okay? There's some other stuff uh, that's sort of computer sciency. Uh, maybe it's worth knowing about. Uh, one of the things that Make, can make your MATLAB code really slow is that usually MATLAB, when you pass things in as an argument, so you know what I'm saying as an argument, like those are arguments up there. Uh, they're reservoir, fluid, numeric, numerical, i and j, those are the arguments of the function t half. 
When you pass in things into a function in MATLAB through an argument, they're, they're, in a computer science speak, they're passed by value, which means a deep, hard copy in memory is made. Which, so so uh, it's a little bit different with the struct is, is what I'm getting at. But you know, say you passed in the variable dx, uh, inside that function, a copy would be made. And dx, what if it had 100 million entries? Now you're going to make a copy inside the function. Right? And t half, you're calling in a loop. So every time you call it, you're, you're taking 100 million entries and you're putting them right there, and then you're throwing them away. And then the next time you call it, you're taking 100 million entries and you put it into there, and you're throwing them away. Every time you exit the function, that gets thrown away. Okay? It's very inefficient. You never want to do that. And in, in C and other languages, including Python, they have something called pass by reference. So instead of actually like copying the data, all it does is pass in a reference to the address in memory. And the, and, and the data stays where it is. And then you go, you know, the computer will go to that address in memory and access it without making that deep copy. Okay? The nice thing about structs is that unless you modify the structure inside the, the function, and in this case we're not modifying it, we're just using it. Modifying it would be meaning, you know, I take dxi and I add 1 to it or add 20 to it, or multiply it by 50, right? I'm changing it. In this case, I'm not changing anything I'm passing in. Right? I'm just using that to do computations, OK? Well, the nice thing about structs in MATLAB is that if they're not modified, they are passed by reference, OK? So in this case, numerical.dx, dx is an array, right? It's an array of all the delta x's. And if you have 100 million of them, it's being passed by reference. So you're not getting that deep copy, and you're slowing your code down. So that's another thing about a struct. If you don't, if you don't modify it inside the function, it's passed by reference, and that's a good thing. Okay. So back to the input file. I think we've basically just been talking about structs the whole time. So we had a, a struct for the reservoir, which is you know just a group of things. Uh, and it, and it, you might ask, well, why do I need reservoir and fluid and numerical? Why can't I just have one struct that's like a problem? Right? You can, and it wouldn't be wrong. But sometimes, sometimes you, you may only need to pass in one of those to a function. You may only need the reservoir. Uh, you may only need the reservoir properties. Right? I'm trying to think. I think that's the case in the accumulation term. You need the reservoir and the fluid, but you don't need the numerical. Maybe anyway, but you could certainly imagine a scenario where, you know, you could group things together and pass them in as arguments, uh, and you could exclude the things you don't need. Right? So if you had a function that's only operating on the reservoir stuff, okay. So this is just more uh, fluid, you know, compressibility. All this is going into the struct. Um, so there's some defined things for the reservoir. Uh, now he's going to go on, and in this in this example, he actually included uh, sort of some code to determine well the, where the wells are. Right. So if you only have four blocks, it's really easy to just you know if if you have four blocks and they're a thousand feet each. You can just by inspection see that the first well's in the first block and the last well's in the last block. But if you if you if you if you allowed yourself the ability to refine your mesh, refine your discretization, take a hundred blocks or a thousand blocks or five thousand blocks, then these guys aren't going to fall in the same block every time, right? So you need a way to uh, you need a way to come up with uh, you know some scheme so that you can determine the block index or the block number that the wells are. Right? So if well number one might be in block 37, you want to know that. And then you refine the mesh and it might be in node, uh, it might be in block 100 or something. Right? So the first thing you have to do is figure out where the grid centers are. Uh, you can actually not, you can do this with it. You, 
You don't need the for loop there. You could do this with a array, array notation. Also, that's another when you're programming, and especially in MATLAB, try to avoid for loops. I mean, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you just have to have them. But if you can avoid them, if you can use the indexed operations, meaning you know, like like I could uh, I could have colon right. One colon. Uh, so I want to go from. If this goes from, two, so it'd be like two. Uh, two minus one. So two. So it'd be one colon to the n minus one, and then you can have some other operations. I did that when I did that uh, trans that interblock transmissibility. I used that type of notation. And anytime you can do that, you're going to be better off. And it and it has to do with when you use that. Index notation, uh, let me just be clear what I'm talking about. So, um, so there I had a um, there's a hundred, a hundred entry. X has a hundred entries, um, and Y. You say it goes from. All right. So let's say now. Let's say I want to add the second entry of y to the first entry of x, and the third entry of y to the second entry of x, and the fourth entry of y to the third entry of x. Right? So you could do that in a loop, right? You could say <coughs> um, for y, for, um, for i equals 1 to 100. Sum i equals to sum equals to x i plus one plus y i. First of all, I think I can only go to 99, and then yeah, okay. So that for loop did what I said, right? It. Uh, it adds the second entry of x to the first entry of y, because i starts at 1, so this is 2, 1. Right? And the next time through the loop, this is 3, 2. And the next time through the loop, this is 4, 3. Right? But I use a for loop, and I don't need to do that. I, I can use uh, MATLAB's indexing. So I can say that x goes from 2 to the end minus y or plus y goes from 1 to the n minus 1. And those give me the exact same answers. But the second one, I wonder if we can do this. Tick. Let's do this. Tick. Okay, now let's see how my for loop does.
What was the other one? That's pretty impressive difference. I did the same operation. That's that's a huge difference in computer time. Because this is this is a this is just a hundred this is just a hundred numbers I'm summing. That's nothing in, in terms of computations. Right? That is an enormous I, I'm shocked actually how much different that is. I thought it'd be maybe one order of magnitude. This is night and day different, right? Um, this, this is the difference for big problems in your code running hours or running minutes. Okay? So, why? I did the same thing. Why? What's the difference? The difference is, is that this thing right here also does a for loop, but that for loop is in compiled Fortran code. It's passing the information into some compiled Fortran code, and it, it's fast. The, for, the, the raw for loop, this thing, is done in the MATLAB interpreter, which is slow. Right. So anytime you write for, stop and think if there's another way to do it. Stop and think if there's a way to use some type of array notation like that. And if you can, you'll be much better off. Now, sometimes you just can't avoid it. For, I mean, for example, if you're marching in time, forward in time, it's very difficult, uh, especially in an implicit problem. I mean, I can't think, I can't think of a way. In an, in an explicit problem, I know how to do it. You can, you can march forward in time only if you have uniform time steps or you know a priori what your time steps are going to be. They don't have to be uniform. But you do have to know beforehand, you know, how what time step you're going to take each time. Uh, you can do it in an explicit problem. In an implicit problem, I mean, you have to stop and invert a matrix every time, right? So there's really no way to do. There's no no way to do uh, without a for loop. So in that case, you just deal with it, or you write your code in C. C plus plus. Okay. So sorry, that was all long-winded way to say that you don't need to do what he did, but <laughs> you can do this much faster. Um, but nevertheless, it's also this is also uh, just an initialization step, meaning this is only done once in the program, right at the beginning. Typically, you know, as a programmer, you, you don't waste a lot of time optimizing things you do once. Right? You want to optimize the things that are being called over and over in the interior loops. You can actually, just like we did with TikTok, there are, pro, there are better profilers that you can actually um, you know, profile your code and see exactly where it's slow. OK, so uh, he computed the, he computed the uh, grid centers. And then with the grid centers, uh, you know, if you know the center of the grid and then you subtract by delta x, you know the left-hand side of the grid, and you add delta x, you know the right-hand side of the grid, right? And so then if you use those two values, the grid edges, and then you, in this case, he ran it through a loop again, now testing, right? So you have a, so he's saying, is the well location, that 5 or 1495, is that less than the left-hand, or, or uh, is it less than the right-hand side? of the grid, and is it greater than the left-hand side of the grid? If so, it's in the grid. Right? It's in that grid block. Right? So you, it, it, there's two if state. Well, it's if, it's if this is true and that is true. Right? So it's if it's greater than the left-hand side, and if it's less than the right-hand side, it's, that means it's in the grid. Right? The well is in the grid. Add that to this well grids, which is just the index of the grid that the well is in. So it'll be like 7 or 35. OK. Uh, then there's also some stuff for the boundary conditions where you can set, uh, well, the left hand side Neumann, right hand side Dirichlet, value 0, value 500. And here's the initial pressure. So it's 1,000. 
All right, so that's just all the initialization. So here's the, the meat of the code. Right? The first thing he does is run the input file function. And that returns him reservoir fluid and numerical and well structures plus the initial pressure plus the boundary condition into those variables. Um, so then he initializes the T, the B, and the Q matrix, and he initializes them as sparse matrices. So MATLAB has a way, so remember, T, B, and, well, T and B are just mostly zeros, right? Just a few entries along the diagonal and the off-diagonal terms. But most of the array, or most of the matrix is zeros. So most, well, this, any programming language that you're going to do scientific computing in has sparse array data storage. So basically, in, in, a, in a sparse array data storage, what you store is the value and the x, you know, the ij pair, right, of what, you know, so you, you have, if you have in the, in the 1, 2 location of the matrix, you have a value 10, you store 1, 2, 10, and that's it. And you only store the non-zero values, the rest of the matrix is zeros, okay? So that's what those sparse array storage are. The, also, when you go then later to solve the code, whenever you use a, sparse array, the, max, the MATLAB backslash, uh, backslash operator, right? it's smart enough to know that I have a sparse array, and then there are very, very efficient ways to solve iteratively, iteratively matrices that are stored as sparse arrays. So you'll get enormous gains in speed of your code by using those sparse formats. Okay? For your four block problem, you won't notice. For the, your project, you'll notice. It'll be the difference in hours or minutes, you know, depending on how the rest of your code's written, too, of course. All right. so, so then we start a loop over the grid blocks. Right? So numerical n is the grid block, so we're going to go from 1 to n over every grid block. Okay? And then there's some logic in there for the boundary conditions. Okay? So basically, this is a 1D problem, right? This is a 1D problem. So in that, you're either on the left side or you're on the right side. There's no other boundaries. So if you're on the left side, that's the first grid block. If you're on the right side, that's the nth grid block. Okay? So he stops and checks. He says, OK, well, if I'm at the first grid block, I'm going to compute the, the ti i plus 1 value. And I'm going to call that t half function, right? At those at the i and the i plus one, I'm going to call that. That's going to return a value, and then I'm going to check. Okay, do I have a Neumann or a Dirichlet condition here? If I have a Neumann condition, uh, if I have a Neumann condition, it really doesn't do much. Uh, but if you have a Dirichlet condition, then you have to do some special things, which include. Remember, uh, in the Dirichlet condition, you had like two. You, you have whatever you normally have on the diagonal, plus 2 times t. And that t is not the inner block transmissibility. It's the transmissibility at the block. But what he does here is he calls t half at the ii location. He calls t i i, right? So all these other places is t i plus 1. So that would be the block left of, you know, the, the block if, if you're if we're talking about, you know, like on a sheet of paper, the left-hand side is block one, then i plus one would be the one block to the right. Okay, that would if you call t half on i and i plus one, you're computing the inner block transmissibility of block i, the one you're in, and the one to your right. Okay, if you call it on the one you're in and the one you're in, you get back just the right. T because what happens is, if you remember in that in, in that uh, t half function, you're computing uh, the inner block um, 
permeabilities via the harmonic average. And if you take the harmonic average of K1 with K1, you get back K1. So this is just a little trick so that he didn't write another function to compute not the half, but the, but the, the, um, the transmissibility of, of the block itself. Okay. So for your project, there are only Neumann boundary conditions. So uh, you know the Dirichlet stuff you can you don't have to do. So you don't need that kind of check in your code uh, to see if it's a Neumann or a, Dir or a Dirichlet. Okay. So if you're not on the left hand side, you're not on the right hand side. You're in the interior, and the the equations for the interior are just right there. No problem. All right. The B, you just have the, the diagonal components. So this is the uh, accumulation term, right? That's the equation for it. Then uh, there's stuff for the wells. Um, Yeah, it looks like he, he actually included the productivity index in this. Um, then here's the conversion factor for the transmissibility matrix. So that, at this point in the code, by line 47, the T, the B, and the Q are set. They don't change again. They're filled with all the interblock transmissibilities. Everything's ready to go. And now we just march forward in time. And so he uh, basically has some other logic in there that says, you know, uh, if you know, numerical method, so he's basically comparing the strings. So if, numer if, the, if the string stored in numerical dot method is implicit, then he's got the implicit method right there. So that's just, that's the implicit method. Notice the backslash operator in there. So the, the term on the left-hand side of the backslash uh, is A, right, the A matrix, and the term on the right-hand side is the B matrix, and you're just solving the matrix equation AX equal to B. Right. And he's also got the explicit in Craig-Nicholson. On your project, you, you only have to do the implicit. Okay? Um, then he's got some logic in there for making plots. Okay? So he, he actually stores every time step. So every time step that he computes the P, he stores it in this P plot, which then he sends to the post process to create the plots. Okay. And so let's see if we run this. Yeah. It looked a little funny to me for a second because the, there's uh, supposed to be a no-flow boundary condition on one side, but uh, but, I, then, but I realized there's wells. There's wells in there, so uh, that's what's causing it to. There's well in the in the in the grid block in the first grid block where there's also a no-flow boundary condition, so it's causing a little bit. Of, that's what I paused about. You can also, so that that's for this system where you have four uh, the changing permeability and changing porosity. I think if we if we comment these two lines out and bring it uh, comment these. So this is now twenty thousand grid blocks, but they're homogeneous. Okay, so lots of grid blocks, but they all have the same permeability and porosity. Sorry, um, I have to save this, but then go back to this is the file I want to run. Yeah, so that.
That's that problem. And then he also has um, the problem where you're reading the porosity and permeability from a file. And that would be what you're going to do on your project, right? In that case, these come from files, and so they're heterogeneous. And um, yeah, so then you get some kind of funny pressure distribution because so each of those lines represent a stage in time, right? Progression in time. Uh, and so then, but you get some irregularities in there because of the, there's irregularities in the, in the uh, permeability and porosity. So you really should be able to get some ideas from this code. Please don't just copy and paste this code and make changes because we are going to ask the TAs to look at the code and I mean we have this one we know that what it looks like so we, we're going to ask the TAs to look at the code and make sure it's not just copy and pasted but you should be able to look at this I mean really it's not that much difference in this code I mean the the difference is that now you have a 2D system so there's just a, a few more checks you have to make if you're on the boundary right because now you have four boundaries instead of two uh, but in that case, they're all no-flow boundaries, so they're pretty easy to handle. Um, you know, other than that, it's it should be pretty straightforward. Are there any questions? Um, just you can feel free to ask me just general programming questions if you want. No, it's just implicit only. I mean, if you want, if you're ambitious, you can certainly do it. That's actually a pretty easy thing to change. It's not. That's one of the easier things to to make. You know. Yeah. Uh, It'll probably be faster than inverse A times B. But it's exactly the same as, uh, there's also lin solve A comma B. The backslash operator is identical to lin solve A comma B. It's just shorthand for it, OK? Um, the, the backslash operator, or lin solve, is much more sophisticated than it looks at the surface. At the surface, you just, it's not just one method like gauss seidel like you might have remembered from your numerical methods class. It's not just an implementation of gauss seidel direct solve. It's an implementation of many, many solvers, both direct and, uh, so when I say direct, I'm talking about like a direct inversion of the matrix. That's what inverse A times B would always do. And when you have a very sparse system, that's not the best way to solve it. When you have a very sparse system, the best way to solve it is an iterative method. So uh, you, you might remember Jacobi iteration. It's sort of the simplest iterative method where you just guess what x is. The x vector, you have a x, right? And you just guess an x, plug it in, and then you're going to have some error between what AX is and B, and you use that error to adjust your new X. And then you just keep plugging in more X's and more X's and more X's, and then eventually you'll converge. The error will be reduced to some, below some criteria, right? And that's very efficient for sparse matrices because you're just doing vector matrix multiplications. But remember, the sparse matrix, you're not storing the whole matrix. You're just sto In that case, you're just storing four entries, right? So a vector matrix multiplication is just for a sparse matrix is only, in this case, not four, three, right? It's tridiagonal. You're only doing three multiplications per row, right? That's way more efficient than trying to do Gauss-Seidel and try to invert the matrix. So that lin solve or that backslash operator is very sophisticated. And what it goes in and, and you know, it, it initially has a bunch of checks. And it's, uh, you know, it checks to see, um, if the matrix is 
sparse or not. In fact, I think, let's, uh, let's see what happens. Let's do, uh, let's do TikTok on this guy. Now, by the way, TikTok is just for debugging. You wouldn't want to <coughs> always do this because that instrumentation itself slows your code a little bit. Okay, so now we had a, uh, it's 1.8 seconds, so remember that. And let's go in here and change where he made them sparse matrices. I think if I just do zeros, now it's a dense matrix where I'm actually storing the zeros, right? Did I not save it? Maybe I didn't save it. That can't be right. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe this problem is just too small to matter. And trust me, big problems, it, it matters a bunch. So, yeah, so MATLAB actually has a it has its own profiler. Um, I don't use MATLAB that much, but I thought it was on the same. Has anyone ever used the MATLAB pro profiler? Yeah, so um, anyway, the, the, the thing there is instead of using TikTok, right, because I could put those TikToks everywhere. I mean, here I'm just wrapping the whole code. I could like put them on a for loop, you know, and just test one part of my code. But what a good profiler do? Well, you just run your whole code, instrument it with the profile, and it'll tell you exactly where it's slow. Like, and it, you know, it'll tell you where the code is spending most of the time, and on what function calls it's spending most of the time. And you'll be surprised that you know, even in really large, high quality production scientific software. 80% of the time in a big simulation is spent in, in very small places, uh, you know, one or two loops. Uh, and so if you, that's really where you want to optimize. And there's a famous um, computer scientist, Donald Knuth. Uh, has anyone ever used LaTeX, like the typesetting language for writing scientific software? If you go to graduate school, you'll definitely use LaTeX. Like, Whenever you see a book and it has nice equations in it and stuff, they didn't write that in Word. You know, that, that, that's done in LaTeX. You know. So this guy, Donald Knuth, is actually the guy that wrote LaTeX, or Tech, rather. Anyway, he has a famous quote. He's one of the most famous computer scientists. He's done many, many other things. There's a famous quote that's something like, I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it's something like, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And what he means is that most of the time, um, most of the time, you don't know exactly where your code's going to be slow. So you really shouldn't spend a lot of time trying to optimize it before you, know, you get it running. Write it, get it verified, meaning make sure it's solving the equations correctly, you're getting the right answer, and then profile it. And use a, use a profiler to determine exactly where it's slow, and then you can use... You know, you can use that information to go in and speed up just little pieces of the code. And you can go to the solution and actually uh, get that code and run, run in time? You had to put the whole. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, it didn't like the M. 
So you just have to type the, the name, not the. Yeah, sh sh like a bar graph showing you where most of it's spent. Yeah. So where where is it most of the time spent? Oh yeah, because you. That's another reason to break down your code into functions. If you if you break it down into functions, then it'll list each function individually, and you can get a better idea of where it's spending the time. Okay. I'm done if y'all are. Uh, I mean, if you, I'll, if you have another question, I'll be happy to answer it. <laughs>